irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is The Rob Black Show. I don't know what this is all about, but I know that Beyonce is on to something. How many times do you hear a financial radio show talk Beyonce? Her new song, Break My Soul, is a sign that the great resignation has seeped into the zeitgeist of our society. The great resignation of people getting tired of going to work. People not wanting to work for the way they used to work, quitting their jobs. It is hitting TikTok hard. And TikTok has what are called quit talks, where people basically quit in a fit of anger or hilarity on a video post. Reddit's got forums dedicated to funny stories about quitting. Not funny stories, but interesting stories interactions with bosses i know someone who recently resigned and his boss begged and almost cried like no 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 no. this has to be a joke right <laughs> right <laughs> more than 47 million people voluntarily left their jobs last year an all-time record more time at home during the pandemic gave people the opportunity to reevaluate their priorities their values Employees are reluctant to give up remote work. I get it. Um, you could say that during the pandemic, I earned two hours of commute time back, and I don't want to give it back up. Hourly wages jumped by 6.1% in May relative to a year earlier, the biggest annual increase in 25 years. Pay doesn't seem to be a, a role here. It's, it's truly finding happiness, finding opportunities and seizing them rather than burnout. I think it's one of the more interesting stories to come out of the pandemic, the great resignation. And what's our workforce truly going to look like in the years to come? I don't think we have an answer yet. What else do we have to hit today? The SP 500 is rebounded into the green as market attempts come back from the depths of the bear market. We are not at a bottom until we get some sort of sign that we can look at and go, oh, that was a little bit dramatic. It could be job cuts. It could be a company implosion. It could be earnings estimates slashed at Bank of America. It's going to be something more than, oh, we had a bad week last week. We don't typically end a bear market with a fizzle. It usually ends with a pop. And again, maybe that'll make this one different. That's the beauty of it all, right? You can find me online at robblackshoe.com. Tesla investors cheered Elon Musk's comments yesterday. The CEO's remark moved the stock in a big way. The EV maker Tesla jumped 12% after Tesla CEO Elon Musk confirmed a workforce reduction, as well as reports that demand for its cars are surging. As anyone knows who's tried to order Tesla, the demand for their cars are extremely high and the wait list is long. This is not intentional. We're increasing production capacity as fast as humanly possible, he says. And he's going to cut the workforce by about 3.5%. A couple of weeks ago, he said 10%. Worthy of note. Um, I would like to see him as a really focused CEO. I would like to see him give up Twitter. But boy, he seems to like the uh, attention that comes with it. But that's just me. Deutsche Bank said the United States is spiraling towards a deeper recession than previously expected. They're the first big bank to predict a U.S. recession in April. Now it's heightening its warning signals. Goldman Sachs talks about stocks that you want to own if you think a recession is coming and you want to live through it. Live through it. That's kind of dramatic, right? Thinking that earnings expectations have already dropped on these companies. Some of the names include Netflix, Analog Devices, Chevron, ExxonMobil, T. Rowe Price, Qualcomm. It's a pretty diverse group of uh, names, right? Like Tyson Foods, Chicken Maker, Qualcomm, Semiconductor Maker, 5G Semiconductors, T. Rowe Price, Big Mutual Fund Company, ExxonMobil, Big Oil Company, Chevron, Big Oil and Gas Company, Analog Devices, Semiconductors and Everything kind of company. But talking about the cut that we've already seen in the stock market valuation, the firm is saying these companies look pretty cheap. 
Skyworks Solutions, Franklin Resources, Micron Technology. And when you look at the charts of a lot of companies from the start of this year, there's some value being created. Is it going from hyper growth value to growth value, growth value to growth and income value? And we get into rock bottom values. That's the big question. Anything you want to talk about, we can talk about money, investing, and more. Younger baby boomers may outlive their 401k savings. That would probably be the worst way to end your retirement is getting to 60, 65 and saying, okay, I'm going to retire. I'm going to take social security. And next thing you know, you're like, I'm tapping off my 401k. Okay, I'm surfing. I'm doing good. I'm doing, I'm good. I'm seeing the grandkids. Now the 401k is gone. See, there's something that's really creepy and really just awful that happens in America. And this, I know you're saying this isn't creepy and awful. It's, it is to me. It's the, when you retire, you don't work anymore. You no longer have income coming in. You can save money, you can earn money, and you can invest money. Those are the three pillars of what we talk about a lot on the show. But when you no longer earn money, you no longer have that ability to have that $14 margarita unless you're pretty darn sure you're going to have enough to last till the day you die, including the diaper change that you'll need when you're 85. So that $14 margarita, oh, that's a killer, right? A lot of people are going to outlive their 401ks. I used to say on the show, I needed a million dollars to retire. Through the years, that number's gone up to over 4 million because I have a spouse and children that I want to actively spend money with. If I just wanted to live in uh, Oki Fanoki Swamp in Florida, I probably only need 400 to 600,000. But because I want a lifestyle that is reflective of, of the love of my family, I might need a little bit more. Demand for adjustable bait. Little, 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 speaking English, Rob. Slap me a little bit. Demand for adjustable rate mortgages surged as interest rates make the biggest jump in 13 years. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The danger with adjustable rate mortgages is they're going to adjust higher still. So you're only getting a five or seven year mortgage. The bank feels a lot better giving you a, a, a smaller rate. But as interest rates move up tied towards the library or prime, you're going to see your mortgage that you're paying now in a seven-year arm pay more next month and more the next month after that and more the month after that. It might reset on an annual basis, but you get the idea. I'm going to like adjustable rate mortgages when the Fed says we're done because probably after that, you'll see rates go lower and then your mortgage payment goes lower, which is pretty cool. 30 seconds. Um, and then you get to the point where the rate goes lower, the rate goes lower, the rate goes lower. That's when you slide in and, and set yourself up for a 15 or 30 year fixed. There's a lot of strategies out there you should be thinking about. You should work with a certified financial planner. I work with a certified financial planner. You need a referral to my certified financial planner. Drop me an email, rob at robblackshow.com. That's Rob. Brought to you by EP Wealth. This is the Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Bitcoin's down, not a lot, but it's down today. Worthy of note, as it seems to be a proxy for the most aggressive asset at this point in time. Bitcoin's down $800, sitting at 20762 It broke below 20000 this weekend. Next stop is somewhere around ten to thirteen thousand. If it continues to not hold twenty thousand, it's fighting right now. Interesting to note, Mark Cuban. You know him from <clears throat> the Dallas Mavericks. You know him from Shark Tank. He's also a crypto bull. One of the things he's done in the past few years is put a focus on a pharmacy that is cutting costs and his pharmacy that he's put together could save Medicare billions. We don't celebrate these stories these days in large part because we're lost in the headlines. We have a nasty Republican Democrat fueled political arena and we have the have and have nots. Um, someone tried to steal my <clears throat> 
part of a vehicle of mine last week and going through that whole process with the police and identifying a suspect and learning about a warrant and learning you're like wow do i do i really need to prosecute this guy to get him to get him in jail to like so you can learn how to do bigger crimes than grand theft auto i don't know there's a lot going on there but anyway um mark cuban the billionaire internet entrepreneur he is trying to disrupt the pharmaceutical prescription drug market i say good for him that's an area that we can get some benefit from for sure uh taking a look at the stock market today general growth concerns are out there you have fed chairman jerome powell testifying right now to the senate uh, later today we're going to see the fed chairman uh, not fed chairman but fed member bullard talk and typically when fed members speak it gets coverage on the financial media and sometimes it's like, yeah, we're probably going to do 125 more basis points in the next 90 days. <clears throat> and they kind of watch to see how the market reacts to that. They do a lot of trial balloons. Crude oil's down $6.23 or 5.7% to $103 a barrel. What could get crude down faster? Uh, presidential waiving of the gas tax. It's not going to work. There's too much resistance. President Obama has called the gas tax a gimmick as far as stimulating the economy. During the 2008 presidential campaign, he called the idea a gimmick that would allow politicians to say that they did something. Uh, at that time, he also warned that oil companies could offset the tax relief by increasing their prices. The president can do remarkably little to fix gas prices. Gas prices are set by global markets, profit driven companies, consumer demand aftershocks from russia and ukraine embargoes that have followed underlying problem is a shortage of oil in refineries and pipelines in our own backyards a challenge that a tax holiday cannot and will not fix mark zandi he's chief economist over at moody's he says the majority of the 8.6 percent inflation that we're seeing in our nation right now comes from higher commodity prices due to russia's invasion and continued disruptions from the coronavirus Coronavirus has hit nations differently as nations have confronted the pandemic differently. China at first had fewer cases because they went into a massive lockdown. They've stayed in massive lockdown mentalities. Anytime there's a, a outbreak, we kind of need everyone in China and the United States just to get it and get it over with. I know that's crazy thinking. But that's where we're at. If we want to focus on the economy, if we want to focus on human health, you go vaccines are important, masking is important, social distancing is important. I know a lot of economists, and I don't know if Biden cares about his job or not, but he should probably be staying up late at night praying for uh, uh, better vaccines, more vaccines, or something along those lines if he's worried about the economy. And then we get other issues like Russia. Things that you can't say, even though Lindsey Graham has said, why don't we just assassinate him? <laughs> Wait, you're not supposed to say that. It would be a, if something were to happen, let's just say Putin were to trip today and fall down the stairs and everyone's like, is he alive? Is he not? You would see inflation come down fast. But the fastest way to see inflation come down, a recession where we fire people where we let people go, where we send the unemployment line. That's probably the socially most unacceptable. Putting a bullet in Putin's head, probably, believe, maybe a little, is that more or not? But Americans are going to drive, and a tax gas holiday isn't going to stop us from driving, and it isn't going to stop the oil companies from figuring ways around it. So oil is slumping over 6% as Biden set to cut fuel costs for drivers. Demand for adjustable rate mortgages has surged as interest rates make their biggest jump in 13 years. In a true sad statement on the United States, 100 million adults have health care debt. 100 million adults have health care debt. 12% of those 100 million, i.e. 12 million, owe more than $10,000. That's one of our problems in the United States. Our health care system is broken in cost structure. No one really understands insurance um, and what it will and will not pay. I told you a couple of years ago, my son got a growth 
in his lymph node down by his family jewels. And he had to go through testing as if it was cancer. It was not. It was just a dirty diaper that caused an infection. But it was in an area that created a reaction that looks cancerous. That was easily $50,000, $40,000 out of pocket for me. And I have some of the greatest health insurance on the planet. Um, doctors just went to town, not preying on a parent's fear, but there was something along those lines as well. 30 seconds left. A Chinese analyst floats a plan to hack Starlink. That's interesting. We still live in this world where the Chinese military analysts um, are thinking about hacking Starlink. Do we get any relief these days? You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube at Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Resources to help you manage your money. Visit robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. I've been doing this financial podcast, financial radio show for 25 years. So back in 2000, when tech stocks fell apart, it was no fun. In the early 90s, it was a lot of fun talking tech stocks. Uh, in the 2006-2008 housing recession, it was no fun. It was a bear market that seemed to drag on forever. Um, it's okay. It's normal. It's healthy. It's part of the process. We've been there. We've done that. So I'm just telling you, sometimes the days are more fun than others. So when we get a little bit of a relief rally, I'm like, ooh, that's kind of a nice relief rally. It feels good because it's not negative, negative, negative. Today, let's take a look at the stock market prices, what we're seeing as far as follow through. Um, not a lot to say at this point in time. We're basically near break even, but sideways is not always down. Let's bring in briefing.com to discuss a little bit about what's going on and whether or not sideways truly is down and or not Patrick O'Hare. Mr. O'Hare, sideways markets, are they, they a relief to you as far as uh, kicking out news? Hey, uh, Rob, good morning. Um, yeah, I, I think at this juncture, uh, sideways market could certainly be construed as good news. And especially uh, we talked to, you know, specifically about the early action today. It is somewhat encouraging um, in that, uh, you know, you had a, a negative open, which was presaged by the futures market. But just as quickly, though, uh, there was buying interest that followed the selling interest. Um, okay. So it was uh, nice to see. And then I think it's perhaps fostered a sense that this deeply oversold stock market is um, it's perhaps in in a mode here where it's trying to, uh, to push up uh, and uh, reclaim some of those losses as we move into month and quarter end. So I'm looking at your page one at briefing.com, the briefing professional service, highly recommended. Where you start today off, um, you quickly get into uh, oil prices and Chairman Powell. Which one do you think is more important short term? And let's talk about it. Well, I I would say oil prices right now, frankly, okay. and I say that I qualify that in the sense that we've heard from Fed Chair Powell, you know, last week. He pretty much, you know, he gave us the rundown in terms of what the decision about the decision at the FOMC meeting. He gave us the rundown about you know what members were thinking about in terms of their their economic and interest rate projections. So. Uh, so I don't think there's anything uh, thus far in what we've heard in his testimony before the Senate Banking Committee today is nothing that's truly, you know, surprising uh, in, in anything he has said. So and that's why I, I kind of lean more toward oil prices at the moment, because, um, you know, inflation is the problem. And, you know, the Fed is trying to combat inflation with higher interest rates. Uh, but like the Fed chair has said repeatedly, uh, you know, the Fed doesn't really have control over what happens with with oil prices, and you know you need oil prices to come down and to help drive down headline inflation. And if it if we can get some moderation in headline inflation, it could hopefully bleed through to core inflation. Um, and and that's why right now I think in terms of you know the rebound effort we've seen off of this morning's uh, week open. It's probably going to be linked in part to that downturn we are seeing in oil prices today as providing a little bit of relief here, uh, potentially for the consumer at the gas pump. Um, but I do have to acknowledge that the, the downturn we are seeing in oil prices today, as well as copper futures and uh, and even unleaded gasoline futures, is 
is also tied in part to this uh, underlying expectation that economic growth is going to slow uh, appreciably in coming months. And with slower growth, you will get, you know, weaker earnings growth. But in this very moment today, anyway, I think the market is trying to put an emphasis on the positive as it tries to also put an emphasis on a, on a rebound-minded trade as we move into month end. Interesting. Uh, we're, we are pushing through the half point of the year. So we've got January, February, March, first quarter done, April, May, June. We're wrapping up the second quarter. Is there anything important about wrapping up the second quarter in your mind, or is that just a, a book um, notation per se? Um, are you looking for a strong pop in jobless numbers? Are you looking for yeah. car prices to come down? Anything that will close us out? Right. Well, you know, I hate to sound like the Debbie Downer here. Right? You know, it's <laughs> you look better you than me. I uh, know. As we move into the second half of the year, right, um, you know, things sh should get more challenging, um, you know, as it relates to the pace of, of earnings growth, probably hearing more in terms of, uh, you know, layoff announcements, um, hearing more in terms of uh, interest rates, you know, policy rates certainly going up, not just in the U.S., but around the world, right? So the ECB, you know, is getting ready to raise rates for the first time in July. Right. And, you know, they're talking about the likelihood that there'll be more rates in September and, and, and then onward. And then, you know, Fetcher Pal even said today and he signaled at the last meeting that, you know, the Fed's going by either 50 basis points or 75 basis points in July. Uh, and that, you know, we're likely going to hear more rate increases. So, so the back half of the year, unfortunately, should be a little bit more problematic. And as we move closer to 2023, you're going to see more of the uh, the lag effect of the rate increases we're getting today start to hit home in you know real economic activity, which is why we think the you know earnings estimates currently uh, are 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 just too high, and those are likely to be subject to downward revision. So, um, so not going to escape the volatility we've seen in the stock market. We will get trading rallies along the way, but the fundamental condition of the market still has not stabilized enough to a point where you can have real confidence in the sustainability of these rebound efforts because you have yet to see any meaningful cut in earnings estimates and you're also going to continue to see an upward move in, in policy rates around the world it's an interesting note that you just talked about earning estimate cuts because i just saw a headline hit that said analysts remain unusually bullish on s p 500 stocks despite despite the downturn what's it going to take to get analyst community wall street and ceos or cfos more importantly to cut earnings expectations because we have snapped back so many times from a 5% down market. We've become very Pavlovian about it. What will break this cycle? Well, we may be near that break. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, uh, we're about ready to move into the Q2 earnings reporting season. It'll get going you know, around mid to the latter half of July. Uh, and we think that you're going to hear a lot more cautious-minded guidance out of these companies as it relates to the full year outlook and as they kind of take a peek into early 2023. And as you get kind of a, a more negative view of the earnings outlook, I think the reality is going to have to hit home for, for you know, individual stock analysts that their estimates are, are just too high. And as they mark them down coming out of that Q2 reporting period, S&P 500 earnings in aggregate will also come down uh, as a result. So, it's uh, it's really going to be, I think, you know, in the communication. We have the, the writing seems to be on the wall, right? You've got, you know, higher energy costs, notwithstanding the decline we're seeing in the last week or so. Energy costs are still elevated. Uh, China has yet to kind of, you know, really fully open up, and uh, it's still stuck with the, you know, zero COVID policy. You have the war, you know, in Russia and Ukraine still going on. Um, you have comp CEO confidence is is extremely weak too, um, and uh, and consumer sentiment is at a record low. Um, so the writing seems to be on the wall that things are are going to be more challenging here in the latter half of the year, and we think that's going to manifest itself in some cautious minded guidance heard from uh, CFOs on these conference calls that are, are going to be heard uh, during the Q2 reporting period. I always enjoy your content, Mr. O'Hara. I always try to save the last minute or two for you. What's on your mind? What are you working on? What do we need to know? Well, you know, we've talked a lot about earnings, and I think you know what is on my mind is kind of like is, is sort of uh, crystallizing for our readers. You know what what to expect in this 
come in reporting period. We are moving to the end of the quarter. You know, the first half of the year, admittedly, you know, earnings earnings growth was better than than feared, even better than expected, right? And I think that's helped keep things elevated. But we do think we're reaching an inflection point there where uh, you start to see a deceleration in the rate of earnings beats, and you're going to start to see an acceleration in the number of companies that are, are warning about their outlook. So I'm going to try and put some color behind that in the big picture article I published on Friday. Thank you very much. Thanks for the content. Thanks for the the words. I'm sorry I don't throw more words your way. I kind of want to listen to what you have to say. It's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. His headline today was the market is up for sale. He talks every day in his um, page one very eloquently about what's going to happen on the market today. And thanks very much. It's Fed Chairman Powell is going to face a share of criticism of the Senate Banking Committee. There's talk about oil. There's talk about earnings expectations. It's kind of a must read in my industry. You can find it at briefing.com. That is briefing.com. Moving forward with what we're seeing out there, billionaire Ron Barron. I've liked him in the past. He's not from Barron's, the financial publication. He's one R, not two R's. But when he talks, he usually talks pretty intelligently. He sees the recent market weakness offering a huge buying opportunity. He talks about two or three stocks that he likes and why he likes them. Um, I think the big picture is that he's saying that he likes the long term. He says, overall, we remain optimistic. We normally don't give much thought to short-term macro issues like inflation, oil prices, interest rates, Russia, Ukraine. In the end, should you? If you're going to invest for 40 years, should you worry about what happened with Russia, Ukraine or what happened with Afghanistan and the United States or what happened? Should it be part of your investment you know, psyche? And I agree with them. It shouldn't. We should be basically investing in capitalism in the United States more so than worry about the short-term issues. Some of his stocks that he likes, Wallbox, a Spanish firm in the electric vehicle charging market. Interesting. Generac Holdings, which is a manufacturer of electrical power generators. With the heat wave, these are super important. With the wildfires, super important. Find me online at robblackshow.com. Find us at robblackshow.com. robblackshow.com. Invest in what is really important. Rob Black has partnered with EP Wealth Advisors. Are you concerned with financial planning, tax planning, managing your investments, or just planning your retirement? Rob Black has partnered with EP Wealth Advisors. With over $12 billion in assets under management and more than 80 financial professionals at the helm, EP has your financial future in mind. Learn more by visiting robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. These were the best of times. These were the worst of times. Actually, nope. This is just the worst of times. It's a pretty crummy year after a pretty wonderful year last year, after a wonderful 10 years on Wall Street. It's been a while since we've had a recession. It's been a while since we've had a bear market. I kind of welcomed them. I know it's kind of like you get the perfect spring afternoon and a shower comes and you're like, ah, I was just enjoying the perfect afternoon. It's okay. Is it great if you're in retirement? Nope. Is it great if you're in retirement and you set everything up to have three years of expenses and a financial plan that works in good times and bad times? It's, it's actually wonderful. It's fine. It's a lovely spring day, just a little bit of a shower. It's a little bit more than a shower. I don't want to make light of it. But today, the S&P 500 is the best of times, rebounding into the green. We've had a bear market that's pulled the NASDAQ down 30% for the year, the S&P 500 about 20 plus percent, 22. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is telling Congress today the central bank will fight inflation, do whatever it takes to fight inflation. I think the Federal Reserve has already admitted that they're okay with some jobs coming out of the economy. And I think that's what we need to see, a higher unemployment rate to cut down on demand. That's one of the things we need to see. We need to see earnings estimates cut. We need to see share buybacks. We need to see companies acquire one another. We need to see companies like Kellogg say, we're going to split into three different divisions so that we can make you, the shareholder, more money, more value should be created. Oil slumping 6% today down to right around $100 a barrel, which psychologically would help a lot of people to see 
sub $100 barrel of oil. Now, this is all because Biden's talking about the tax gas holiday. Gas tax holiday. Why is that difficult for me to say? Is that a sign that I've had a stroke? I promise if I ever have a stroke, a heart attack, or uh, instant death, I will do it on air. It's part of my contract. Demand for adjustable rate mortgage surged as interest rates make the biggest jump in 13 years. It's a little bit early to feel comfortable doing that because in the short term, we expect interest rates to continue to march higher at least 150 basis points. So if you got into an arm that you're comfortable with and it's readjusting on a monthly basis, your payment's going to go higher is the likely expectation for 2022. Just make sure what you signed up for, you know that there's some rubber in the stretchiness of it. Um, I will be very interested in getting an adjustable rate mortgage in about 150 basis points when I think the upside is limited or the downside is possibility in interest rate moves. Now, again, that number can change. I'm just telling you where I'm going to get interested and I may have to readjust as we get closer. 100 million adults have healthcare debt of $10,000 or more. That's 12% of us. So 12 million Americans have healthcare debt of $10,000 or more. And that sucks. Something we don't talk about enough on the show and CFP Chad Burton at EP Wealth does. He was my former partner at New Focus Financial. He's big into healthcare. I don't agree with all of his thoughts on healthcare because he's a health nut. I'm more of a walker. He's more of a P90 kind of guy. I'm more of a jogger. He's more of a, you know, 1 million burpees in a day. With that said, I'm a big fan of flossing my teeth twice a day because healthcare is expensive. And when your health care in your mouth fails, it's dentures. That's not good. Um, so healthcare is expensive. Healthcare is something you can do to help your financial health in the future. When I say 100 million adults have healthcare debt, 12% of them over 10,000 or more, that could be something a walk helps. Diabetes and overweight, absurd problem in the United States. There is a new diabetes drug that is starting to make the rounds that will help cut weight as well as cut type two diabetes numbers. It's going to be fascinating if this is basically like a cable modem of weight loss. You know, the, when the cable modem came along and the internet speed started to blaze, will this be something that is truly revolutionary in healthcare? It very, very well is in the right area. It could be. Joe Biden's calling on a three-month suspension of gas and diesel taxes, 18.4 cents per gallon federal tax in the United States, 24.4 cents a gallon for federal uh, diesel. Diesel. California has high gas taxes. So this is going to save some people some money, maybe, if the oil companies don't raise their prices. Maybe if you happen to live next to a refinery, maybe if you happen to live next to a pipeline. The president can do remarkably little to fix oil prices. They're set by global markets. This president, Joe Biden, has already cut or dipped into our, our reserves with little to no effect. What would help our oil markets right now would be Putin choking on a piece of ham. And <laughs> you're saying, where did that come from? I'm almost trying to be comical, wanting to project what would be wonderful if someone died. And that's creepy and dark and that's wrong. And that doesn't make me a good Christian or anything like that, right? But the invasion in Ukraine is creating a lot of problems with inflation, as is the way we're handling COVID in China and semiconductors and the stuff that they manufacture for the world. Very little the president can do about this right now. And a gas tax holiday, Barack Obama said in 2008 that it's a gimmick. It allows politicians to say that they've done something. It also He also warned that oil companies just couldn't raise the prices and absorb that tax. He's not wrong. Beyonce's got a number one hit. It's called Break My Soul. This is interesting because listening to the lyrics, I was instantly uh, attuned to the idea. I know you're saying, Rob Black listened to a Beyonce song? Well, here's the first lyrics. And I just quit my job. I'm going to find new drive. Damn, they work me so damn hard. Work by nine, then off past five. And they work my nerves, and then I can't sleep at night. 
This is a problem in America. 4 million Americans, 47 million Americans quit last year and roughly 4 million Americans are quitting a month right now. It's a torrid pace where people are trying to prioritize happiness over their bosses. <clears throat> and what's interesting about it is the people who are left at work, they're getting unhappier and unhappier. So we have a bit of a problem on our hands. And one tweet that I saw was, Beyonce wants us to quit our jobs and make a living on our own terms. You heard the woman. I'm not sure how remote work's going to work. I know that Airbnb has said, anyone who wants to work remote can work remote. And I've heard Elon Musk say, you have to be a genius to work remote. Otherwise, you're coming into the office. And in between, there's a lot of unhappy people. Listen to this crazy statistic. If I just leave this to you for right now, you'll go, wow. TikTok's on pace to triple ad revenue this year. TikTok, is it destroying civilization? Elon Musk thinks so. Destruction or not, the wildly popular short form video app only represents a fraction of the digital ad market. And yet they are growing fast with Generation Z's hands, hearts, and wallets. Interesting on how TikTok is going to start moving more and more into advertising. They get a very small piece of it. TikTok is a subsidiary of a China-based ByteDance. TikTok is on pace to make up $12 billion in advertising revenue this year, three times what it made last year. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube at Rob Black Show. Drop me a question, and I'll try to answer it on air. Rob at robblackshow.com. It's rob at robblackshow.com. Need a referral to a financial planner. Drop me an email, rob at robblackshow.com. Irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is The Rob Black Show.